I'm reporting back on the final of the Fisher Random World Championship. Two players contesting the final, Hikaru Nakamura and Yan Nipomnishi. Really tense. They played this four-game match. It was two all at the end of that. <clears throat> Nakamura had struck first, but Nepo hit back. Really interesting games. Anyway, they went into an Armageddon game. Just one game. White had 15 minutes. The players would actually bid to see who would play with black. They put in uh, a suggested time, and whichever was the lower time would take black. So in the end, well, Nepo won the bidding, if that's what you can call it. So Nakamura 15 minutes at the start. Nepo 13 minutes, two minutes less, but he had black and draw odds. I hope that makes sense. This was the position they started with. Uh, they were given five minutes to look at this position. Interesting to see uh, Wesley So helping Nakamura before the game. Um... Just chatting through things. Wesley So, of course, before this tournament, the reigning Fisher Random World Champion. Bishops in the corners. They're, they're fianchettoed already. That's kind of interesting. Um, king position slightly strange. You know, it's it's hard to castle in this position, actually. You know, you have to clear all these pieces away if you want to castle kingside, for example. Okay, let's see what happened. So, remember, Nakamura... 15 minutes on the clock, he's in a must-win situation with white. And there's no increment either. Right, that sets free the bishop. And Nepo does the same. <clears throat> and prevents white from, from moving forward with the g-pawn. e4, striking out in the middle. e5, all symmetrical so far. F4. Well, I guess Nepo could have played d6 to hold the middle, but instead f5. Play, both players playing very, very quickly. So symmetrical so far, but now, of course, the, the tension breaks with captures. This is a very unusual position. So this pawn, excuse me, this bishop attacked in the middle, and there's a bit of tension here as well. Um, bishop takes bishop, bishop takes e5, and pawn takes f5. Material is still even. This bishop is way right across the other side of the board. That pawn is isolated. So you could say that Nakamura has perhaps achieved a little something. However, we have opposite colour bishops on the board. Interesting, the bishop comes back here. It's, it's going to be attacked, so it, it's probably got to move back. But notice it comes back here because the king is going to find a safe square on b2. <clears throat> and that will connect the rooks. And likewise, this bishop comes back. And the king can come to b7. Finds a nice safe square and the rooks are connected. But there's no doubt that white is better in this position. This is a weak pawn, and potentially that square in front of it can be uh, used as well. Queen h5. Defending the pawn, attacking that one, reasonable. And here Nakamura goes for queen f2. I mean, he, he was playing very quickly. Um, Queen e2 looks like a, a very clear way of playing. I can imagine that he just simply sort of didn't think about exchanging queens. Maybe he thought, you know, I want to keep some tension in the position. But really, this already looks tremendous for white. Pieces beautifully placed. Rook can come across to attack this one. Uh, the knight has a nice square here or here. Great position for white. But queen f2 played very quickly. Also looks very natural. But there is a problem. And I suspect he underestimated this move. Knight h6. And very often black is able to, to leap into g4. Exchanging pieces. And remember with opposite colour bishops. 
more pieces are exchanged, then black is heading closer to a draw. Knight e2, knight e6, nice development, rook f1, king b7. Black has a very stable position here. That pawn is isolated, but you can see the rest of black's pieces, and particularly the bishop and knight here, are very solid. It's hard for white to achieve anything. I mean, really, you know, if you take that pawn, well, that actually just loses a knight. And because of black's active pieces, it's very hard for white to actually build pressure on that f5 pawn. And I think Hikaru realised at this moment that he would have to engage in a bit of hustling here, basically, if he wanted to get something from the position. Remember, he's in must-win situation. He played d4. Now, I looked at that move when the players were playing. I was watching it live, and I just thought, that is such an ugly move. But somehow, it's such a Hikaru move. He realises that positionally that's compromising, that black now has access to the e4 square. But he also realises he has to shake up the position if he's going to have any winning chances here. If he just played sort of normal moves, then you know it would be far too easy for black to exchange pieces, you know, something, something like this. And, you know, if you're getting a position like this, you can see that, well, it's very hard to stir that one up. All black's pieces look good. I mean, black can even be better in this kind of position. So d4, positionally really compromising, giving away that e4 square. But it stirs the position up. Let's see, knight g4. Queen takes f5. So obviously if knight takes, then queen takes. So queens are exchanged. Knight takes h2. Rook e1. Well, it still seems that black is absolutely fine here. But you've got to watch out for d5 in some positions. That knight is a little bit wayward. I mean, black has a big choice here, actually. I mean, perhaps you'd like to have a little think. How would you play with black in this position? Remember, you just need a draw. How are you going to sort of stabilise this position? It's actually, well, as Nepo found out, it's not so easy. Black to play. How do you calm it down? There are lots of moves here. Knight f3. Perhaps knight g4. Um, but bishop e4, that has to be the safest move. Attacking the knight, and if the knight comes back, d5. Lock that bishop in here, and lock that bishop out of the game. Now, there are, I'm sure, a few more twists and turns from coming from this position, but that feels very stable. Nepo played rook f8, which also looks very sensible, attacking the knight. But watch what happened. Knight e3, threatening d5. So the bishop came to e4. Now d5. Well, that's, that's a nice move because it disturbs the knight. Knight g5. You can see how, well, things still seem okay for black. But now knight f4. Well, okay, that's that's very stable for white. The knight looks good there. And now black has a bit of a dilemma. So this knight probably needs to come back into the game, but could come here. But well, the rook would just move. Then the pieces, just for a moment, seem to sort of tread on each other's toes. There's certainly not the the simplification that Nepo would like, which he seemed to be heading towards much earlier before the queens were exchanged. Rook e8, king b2, nice move, connecting those rooks. 
And again, black has a big choice here. Do you play the knight back? What else do you do? Bishop f3. <clears throat> Very interesting. Nepo still has this idea in his mind of trading off knights, trading off pieces, getting closer to that opposite colour bishop's endgame. But watch what happens now. Before this happens, d6. And I think Nakamura really shows his experience here. Once again, he appreciates he has to randomise this position. And this gives black a big choice of possibilities. Do you take it? Do you play c6 or do you play c5? Remember, Nepo's short of time. Which one do you do? Funny thing is, you know, if you feed this into a computer, it thinks that all of them are possible. But they're all subtly different. <clears throat> I mean, one could take the pawn, but then knight f5 is, is such a tricky move. Um, if rook e1, watch this, check here, rook takes, and it's not possible to take the knight because of bishop b4 check. So, you know, after pawn takes, as soon as you see a move like knight f5, you kind of go, whoop, no thank you very much, that looks a bit tricky. Could play c5, that's possible, that's reasonable. But Nepo went for c6, so quite a cagey move, just making sure that the d5 square is covered. So it's all very understandable. <clears throat> um, you know, he's just trying to contain white's pieces. But watch what happens. Knight c4. Maybe it's, it's too late for containment, because that knight is heading into e5. So this is what happened. Knight here and knight e5. Very nice. Looking at this pawn, looking at the bishop. Um, the computer likes rook f5 in this position. I wouldn't say that's a very obvious move. It certainly doesn't feel very desirable to split the rooks in that way. But Nepo just took on c3. I mean, he's, you know, he's trying to clear pieces out of the way. And bishop g4. <clears throat> So that protects d7. Rook e3 from Nakamura. But you can see that what stability he's found in the position. What a transformation. And playing rook e3, you know, it's looking to corral this knight here as well. If knight f3, then the bishop can be taken. So that's why h5 was played, covering that bishop. But you can see this is a this is a bit out on the limb. Rook e1. I mean this is and now knight takes bishop is threatened again because of the threat here. I mean white has a wonderful position now. And yeah, it's it's just very hard for for black to find a decent move in this position. Really difficult. So that is the threat. So Nepo decided to just sack an exchange, knight f3. He's not actually winning the exchange back because of rook e8. So rook f6, attacks here, and rook h1. Rook takes d6. Well, if this knight could sort of spin into the game and in combination with rook and bishop, get some kind of attack, all well and good. But it is really hard to achieve that with black. Um, there's a little trick here. Knight takes would not be a good move because of rook h6. That pin is annoying. But Nakamura played an excellent move, rook g8. And now knight takes pawn is a threat because the bishop is attacked. Yeah, not an easy move. Nakamura found it very quickly. And if rook h6 guarding the pawn, then pin and win again. So rook d2 played by Nepo. He's trying to drum up some chances. Knight takes pawn, so now material, well, pawns are level, and Nakamura is just a rook for a bishop up. Bishop 
bishop f5 attacks here, rook c1. In fact, the pieces really can't achieve much. Rook here, knight g7. So impressive at this during this phase. Nakamura was playing really quickly, just keeping the pressure on his opponent. And that knight g7, that is such an awkward move for black to meet. The bishop is attacked. The knight suddenly looks like it's going to spin in here and maybe here and maybe here. And it's just really tricky. You know, how do you deal with that one? Where do you place your minor pieces? Bishop b4, knight e8, so threatening a big check, but also it might spin back here. It's such an awkward position to play. Rook h6, covers those squares. Rook f8, well, you might play knight f6, you might play rook f6, and you're keeping an eye on the knight, very good. d5, well, understandable, because it protects the bishop but rook f6, and you can see the king is in big trouble because the 7th rank is now open, as, as well as the 6th rank actually, it's not pleasant at all. Rook h3, knight check, and knight takes bishop. So, mission accomplished for that knight. It's managed to exchange off that potentially dangerous bishop um, well, it's just the process of, of simplifying down. Rook g6 covers this one. Uh, of course, you just have to make sure this pawn isn't running, but after e3, first of all, give a check, and then king d3. That avoided a, a knight fork, of course, and this pawn can be picked up. So, basically, white is just in control here. The pawn can't advance. There's nothing really in white's position to attack. Rook e6, rook e2, and now the counterattack begins. The rook is zooming down the board. b5, a3, that's a, a very calm little move. Just saying, okay, I don't think you can do anything in this position. And it's true. And rook check, here we go. The final attack. That's a very neat little move, looking at this knight, which moved, then b4 check, and rook h5, a very fine final move. And rook c5 mate is going to come very soon. Really sound technique from Nakamura. He banged out you know, these last, I don't know, 20, 25 moves very, very quickly. Uh, and just kept putting the pressure on Nepo. Um, and it was extraordinary seeing how Nakamura just managed to complicate. Just when you thought the position was going to settle for black, he managed to find a new way just to stir up trouble. And I think, you know, there, there are a few moves here. That deep on advance. You know, there are a lot of the, the world's top players that would just wouldn't even consider that move. They'd find some some other way to play the position. But with d4, they'd kind of go, Ugh, sorry, too ugly for me. But Nakamura, he just understands. Whatever it takes, you've got to do it. And then later on, again with the d-pawn, d6, such a clever move. And that really um, short-circuited Nepo, actually. Somehow in this situation, I think, you know, Nepo was thinking, I need a draw. And he kept trying to keep control of the position. But I think it was too late for that, actually. And, yeah, very quickly he achieved, uh, well, Nakamura achieved a beautiful position with, with these pieces. So, Hikaru Nakamura is the... World Fisher Random Champion, and he picks up 150,000 US dollars, which isn't bad. Nepo uh, can cry into a very expensive pillow with $85,000. Magnus Carlsen won the third place playoff for what it's worth, 
Um, but I think he will be very disappointed with the result. But fair play to Naka. I've seen him in so many rapid play events. And he is so impressive at, at these time controls. Right, more coming soon on the Powerplay Chess channel. Remember, if you're if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. I'm creeping up very slowly to 100,000. And the Halloween sale is still going on at Chessball. My courses, How Good Is Your Chess, How Good Is Your Chess 2, and the Kalashnikov Sicilian, they're still on sale for about a, another day. So do check it out. Thanks for watching.